My name is Christopher Ewasdell Kidman, and it is my pleasure to welcome you to the 11th video in the Communal Practices series. When I began my work in family therapy, the field, as it were, was filled with those who were experimenting within the specifics of their own cultural realms. There were experimenters, experimenters in Italy, Ireland, Norway, Finland, as well as here in Canada and the US. These experimenters developed their work often with a systemic influence within, within their own unique contexts. It was a beautiful time. However, over the years, things changed and therapeutic work was seen as valuable only in the context of what was called evidence-based practices. That is, only those approaches to practice which could locate large sums of money to do particular forms of research could be recognized. The small experimenters, working from within their own cultural contexts, tended to disappear from the landscape of therapeutic discourse. For some of us, this was gravely concerning. My friend and mentor, Lynn Hoffman, was particularly concerned about this trend. She had spent her career discovering and documenting these small experimental movements, and now this work was being ignored. Hoffman came to the work of family therapy from the arts. She was a book editor in New York and was asked to come and edit Virginia Satir's books. From the beginning, she saw such human services work not as therapy or even counseling, but as something she later called communal practices. And consistently from the beginning and to her last days, her interest was in this work more as an art than as a science. But her voice tended to fall on deaf ears for the push for evidence-based even though even as science so much of it was suspect, kept pushing itself into the spotlight. So in this context, today's guest comes to play. For Mary Keene is not a scientist. She is a poet. She spent her early poetry years in the company of the beat poets. And as you shall see in this video, she was particularly close to Allen Ginsberg. So today, as we once again explore communal practices, we do so through the lens of a poet. A poet who coincidentally is also a family therapist and one from the early family therapy traditions that I talked about. I pursued Mary for this interview for I wanted to explore a poet's voice. Mary talks about forests, trees, neighborhoods, she stops to give a greeting to a crow passing above. She talks amidst the tomatoes and flowers of her garden. She reminds us of the Anglo-Saxon roots to the English language, something she learned in part from Ginsburg. She reminds us of the power of simple one-syllable words over the complicated Latin words that we received via the conquering Romans. Through all of this, she ties us to communal lives, to a community that moves within generous and straightforward interactions, to a community that includes forests, crows, and seagulls, to the communal values that are held amongst those indigenous to these lands. Please listen to Mary and listen with care and love Mary is a humble soul. It's easy to overlook the importance of her words due, due to her gentle ways. But please, listen, take it in, and let yourself be awoken and loved through the words she evokes. Welcome to the poet, Mary Keene. Mary Keene. Thank you. Thank you for doing this for me. Um, I really appreciate it. And um, 
how um, how do you want to be identified? Do you want to be identified as a poet or as a family therapist or like how would you choose to be identified? All of the above. All of the above. What else am I missing? Well, I made this garden. Gardener. I designed Beautiful. it and made it, and uh, with help. Yeah. With a tremendous amount of help. From volunteers and friends. And a beautiful garden it is. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, I think I would be if, like to be identified as a helper. Love, love that. And a <laughs> supportive friend. I love that. <laughs> and um, ardent community member. Beautiful. Kind of with, in the light of communal practices, could you talk a little bit about being a helper and what that means? Well, um, I am a very supportive person. Pretty much everybody will tell you that, that you know. But I'm also um, uh, quite truthful, shall we say. I'm a very candid person. Yeah. So um, there's a way in which the way I'm going to help you is. I don't practice idiot compassion. I believe that being honest about the situation in a compassionate way. You don't use honesty to just excuse yourself for venting. Yeah. That's not what I mean. But um, I think being a helper is being clear. And so I work very much on that and have all my life to have some clarity about what's going on. Um, that has been vital to me, and it's been vital to me to run into people who have helped me with that, mm -hmm. who have spoken to me very clearly about what they saw me doing or being. Like, I'll give you an example, yeah, yeah. was um, when I was uh, writing and practicing poetry in Boulder, um, hi guys, one of my um, mentors and friends, Allen Ginsberg, has read some of my earlier poems when I really was starting with that. I had been writing poems since I was nine years old, but working with the beats and uh, getting into working with such a giant as Alan. And he said, you know, Mary, what is it you really want to say? You're hiding. You know, these are pretty highfalutin words you're using here and very Latinate. That's hard to take as a young poet and as, you know, trying very hard to express yourself. And he said, look at the language, look at the words and how they're working. And and it was like he opened a door for me. And I had to be strong enough and brave enough to hear that it wasn't landing very well. Mm. You know, and that it could land better if I would pay attention mm. to what the beats were about from their, stand, from their point of view. And um, the contrast between, you know, we actually are a conquered people, you know, the Romans uh, and there's the whole Latinate quality to our speech, which means that you don't say things clearly and straightforwardly. There's a whole lot of um, equivocating in the Latinate words. You know. That's interesting. I didn't know about that. Yeah, nobody does, I think, mm -hmm. you know, until you really study it, until yeah. you really study the English language. And you see that, that we're a compilation of many languages. Yes. Yeah. You know who wrote about that? Deleuze. He, he um, loved um, English-American literature at the time, you know, um, including the beat poets. And uh, but he felt like the English language was an extremely rich language because it was 
combination of everything. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And so Alan, um, um, Alan Ginsberg, um, gave you some thoughts about writing, and, and uh, how did that affect your writing after that? Oh, well, it um, discombobulated me, depressed me, upset me, but I took it down and um, worked it on, worked on my work and thought, you know, I, I just kind of threw everything out and went back to the drawing boards. And um, I became, I, I first of all really studied what he meant by that, about the Latinate mm. and Anglo-Saxon and uh, you know, uh, Anglo-Saxon words are generally one syllable. Dog, God, shit, yeah. mix, <laughs> jump, whatever, is uh, it's very simple and direct. Yeah. And it, it's, it does something for us, yeah. those of us who have that background. Yeah. And um, I don't know, I'm wondering as we're talking, Perhaps one of the reasons American English can do that is that um, the people who settled the United States or settled in North America early on were um, common people. They weren't highfalutin people no. in general. No. They only became highfalutin yeah. later when it was an elitist thing to come over on the Mayflower right. or whatever. As I'm listening to you, I, I'm, I'm realizing that you're, you've got a lot of wisdom when it comes to language. Oh, thanks. And, yeah. and but that idea that you're, you know, what you've been talking about here is fascinating, and I'm, I was wondering if that's a line that we should follow in this conversation, you know, what you've learned about language. Well, you know, I think it really plays into everything that we know together about therapy and communal work and everything, because language is the way we even think to ourselves about things. Yes. And of course, um, uh, all the great therapists study language very diligently, yeah. because that's our tool. Yeah. And if you're going to uh, communicate, very Latinate word. If you're going to talk, you better you better get it down. Yeah. You know how that's going to go over. So, do you see the Anglo-Saxon tradition as being one that is more straightforward, kind of, uh, uh, than the Latin? Well, I think yes. I suppose yes. Uh, but it is more central to our fiber as tribal people, mm. those of us who are of that tradition. Can you tell me more about that? Well, I mean, you know, as tribal people, we were conquered by the Romans. Mm. And then we were conquered again by the French. And I dare say the Vikings had a few things to say, <laughs> you know, and so, and then there were squabbles amongst ourselves and, you know, yeah. not to mention the Irish and the English or the Welsh yeah. or you, you name it. And it's almost like the tribal guts of our language have been laminated over by all those various conquerings. So actually in our hearts, we know something very much about being colonized. And even though there was the British Empire, that was kind of uh, old news, you might say. Right. It, wasn't, um, it, it wasn't the core of the tribal people. Right. So that's about all I can say about it at this point, except that I think that... A lot of what we're in a muddle about has been building up a great deal over time. And if you read um, Piketty, have you seen that? Um, he's a French economist. Oh, yes. You yes. Know I, I know who he is. You know who I'm talking about. And <clears throat> he, he really focuses a lot on the colonial, the empires and the colonialism of, uh, and the colonialist 
practices and how that destroyed the basis of economies in, say, Haiti. Haiti's a wonderful example that he gives. And um, the reparations that were expected after wars that were just leveling, absolutely leveling to people. They couldn't, couldn't deal with it. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, Haiti, for example, has never managed to come back. They were given a huge reparation for their uprising against the French, and they could never really come up, come back from it. And we see it over and over and over as they try to to get up, you know, and get it together. And um, so those practices, economically, not to mention the language, are devastating. Unpack a little bit the economic practices you're talking about. Well, I just think you should read Piketty. Yeah, I know, but for the film, I'm wondering if we Well, could... I would have to... This would take up the whole film, but... We'll, we'll start. We'll see where we go. Okay, well, economically, I, I think I've said mostly what I've yeah. grasped of it, is um, that when uh, people are colonized, you know, they, they become dependent. I mean, we're seeing this in Afghanistan. Yeah. Look what's happening. You know, I mean, for 20 years, if you wanted to get a job, and a good one, who had the money? Yeah. And who needed translation? And if you had a pretty good grasp of English, you know, which might not be too hard since the place was flooded with Americans and there was a lot about education and educating the women and so forth, well, what would you do? Put it together. Yeah. So, hey, I would become an interpreter, wouldn't you? Yeah. I mean, we'd all be interpreters. Yeah. Yeah. And that's what we're seeing. And now, they're at terrible risk for that. Yeah. You know? So, I mean, it's economics, but economics is ecology, it's environment. Which is another thing I want to talk about, hmm. because that's where I am today is we are working very diligently to do something about global warming. Yeah. And um, but talking about language, originally it was called global warming by the weather experts yeah. and so forth. Yeah. And the spin doctors began to call it climate change. Right. That's a spin. Yeah. That's not the original words. The original yeah. words was global warming. Yeah. Well, that's very frightening. <laughs> and we don't want that, do we, Chris? <laughs> well, we're having it whether we want it or not. <laughs> well, I'm with Greta Thunberg. I think, you know, let's get panicked. Yeah. Let's get good and panicked. We're in, excuse the metaphor, but hot water here. Yeah. You know, so it's, uh, it's worth it. To get a little scared. Yeah, get a little scared. Well, we're certainly out that way out in, in the interior of British Columbia. It was like... I don't know how you made it. I was very worried about you. Well, we've got a new season. It's called Smoke. Well, I'm really glad you're here because it's a little bit better here. Well, it's one of the reasons we came was to get away from the smoke. But the day we left, the smoke left. <laughs> or mostly left, anyway. But it's uh, really disrupted the whole whole summer thing. Oh, yeah. You can't go out and bike or any of that stuff, or go for a walk. Or all of that and breathing all that stuff. Yeah, and you can't know. But the sadness and the tragedy of it is immense. And there's another element to it that um, we need to pay attention to as well. And it's only close to my heart, but uh, the in, across this land or across the continent. The indigenous people would do prescribed burnings in the springtime mm -hmm. when there was still moisture in the soil, and they would, uh, and it would affect the way that the, the fires of the summer moved, right? And it would disrupt them, and also protect their communities as well. But mm -hmm. but they all were doing this, so it happened all over, and it created really real barriers for the fire. And then part of colonization was that was all made illegal. Yes. And um, and so the the, the tinder has just been growing and growing and growing. You know. mm -hmm. 
that's that, so that's another element to it. You know, colonization has had some awful influences. Well, and not only that, to go further with that discussion, yeah. you know, um, I talked to um, a, a gentleman who is, uh, he has a company planting trees. But anyway, we were chatting, and he said that, um, I said, Dick, why don't you work on planting in such a way, I've read that aspen trees, for example, are extremely resistant to yeah. fire, and they will often as the fire, before it's gotten into monumental flames, aspens yeah. can cut it, yeah. you know, and everything. Why don't you guys do some of that? He said, Mary, I work for the for the uh, lumber interests, yeah. the lumber companies, yeah. and so the forest products, they call it. Now, there's the languaging, forest products. Yes. And so um, we they tell us what they want us to plant, and we plant it. Yeah. I said, why don't you say you're not going to do it? Well, he laughed, and that's something that I find that when you speak truth, oftentimes you get the laugh or yeah. you're crazy, yeah. and I think that's a first, first line, and then after people are laugh at you or think you're crazy, then they get angry, and then finally they come to acceptance because they've worked through their own grief and loss. Right. And I mean, if he has to do this as a living, my God, you know, look what he's up against, you know. My compassion for him and for the people who have been doing these businesses, like yeah. lumber products. Yeah. You know, when they came in, there was no lumber products. Yeah. You know, but now there is. You know, and it's been that way for a long time. So it's kind of getting baked in, isn't it? Mm. And um, the problem is they won't. They just want to pl plant trees that will produce, of course, good lumber, like pine, which burns, you know, lickety-split, yeah. and there's no break with right. a mix of, yeah. you know, like that. But I think perhaps we're coming to some uh, realizations about that. Well, as I listened to you talk about it, I realized you were still talking about language. Yeah, this is what lumber I'm Lumber products. And so you're, you're, it permeates everything. Yeah. 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 So we have to find new ways to talk. Yeah. Or very old ways to talk. Or very old ways to talk. I love that. Tell me more. Um, I was thinking about what you said about the indigenous people. And, you know, Boy, have we missed the boat on that, right? Yeah. Now, I don't want to say, I don't want to get into something where, you know, we can't be negative about our predecessors. Ignorance is the cause of suffering. Yeah. Right? Ignorance is the cause of suffering. So, they thought they knew what they were doing. Yeah. But, my God. And isn't this, we know this as therapists. You know, you think you know what you're doing, and my God, you find out. Mm, it's true. this. It's like this colonial spirit is one of assurance. We know what we're doing. Mm -hmm. You don't. Right. That's right. And um, that's why I love Harleen Anderson's idea of not knowing. Mm -hmm. I think it's got tremendous repercussions. Mm -hmm. You know. It's or, or asking permission. Yeah. Go well, on. Yeah. I can't think of the woman's name that worked with David Epstein, the wonderful woman that, you know, she was a nun for a while, that did the asking for per asking permission. Anyway. Tell me more about that. Well, I mean, you know more, you know more about that. Well, I don't know what you're meaning, so I'm curious. I want to learn about it. Um, before I go there, I would like to go back to, um, this is a, this is an Insu Kim Berg move. Good. We're never going back, but <laughs> um, Insu very much influenced me, by the way. Anyway, um, I, I, before we leave the thing about the forest, I did want to say that I think there are some more effective ways to, um, to bring about resistance or even teachings with people who are um, in, invested in carrying on with destructive practices. And I think one of those is the um, lessons from the people who worked in the Great Bear 
rainforest and they they went to um, through the supply chain and found who was buying Canadian lumber yeah. from British Columbia yeah. and asked them if they would want to be a part of this destroying the rainforest, mm. the Great Bear Forest. And of course they didn't. Yeah. So they got all these uh, flashy companies to sign on to say, stop, stop yeah. tearing down the rainforest, protect the Great Bear Rainforest. That's really smart yeah. and generous. Yeah. So, and in that way, I think there's a learning, like, you, you know, people, petroleum folk will say, well, we would quit selling gas and oil and, and doing ling if nobody bought it. But of course, they are going to buy it. Yeah. But in the case of the Great Bear Rainforest, they said, we're not going to buy it. The, the big people, not just yeah. people buying lumber like we do at the lumber yard, but yeah. you know, people who are using it for big, huge projects. Right. So. Let me pose this question, and it might lead you somewhere else, and who knows. But Great. But we'll start, start or dough. Okay. Um, what might a poet know about forests that we need to know? Well, of course, the first thing that comes to my mind is Gary Snyder, mm -hmm. the great poet. Gary Snyder in Turtle Island, and you know, uh, he's the, <clears throat> he was a forest ranger, yeah. you know, and um, so all I would have to say is read Gary Snyder, you know, uh, he, he, Gary Snyder's advice was, uh, when he came to Naropa, when I was there, was learn all the names of the flowers and the trees. And if you want to, if you want to change things, stay where you are. Yeah. So, those are that's beautiful advice. Yeah. Both of those. Yeah. Yeah. Robert Bateman used to say that about naming, knowing the names. Knowing the names. He says, know the names of the living things around you. Of course, now we've, we've got a new challenge because we need to learn some new names. We need to know, we need to learn some indigenous names. Yes. And um, because uh, the names we typically use have a whole colonial history to them. That's right. So um, that's a new beautiful challenge. Yes. I have to study some of the native um, First Nations languages. I, I remember uh, we went to Bella Coola to do a workshop there um, on, a, on the adoption. We worked yeah. a lot with adoption because uh, Arden's father was an adoptee, so he had a lot of heart for that one. And, w and when we started working with it, the files were just being opened so yeah. people could find their mothers and fathers and so forth. And so the indigenous communities were very seriously involved in all of that. And so we went to Bella Coola to do some workshops about adoption. And um, I remember Arden getting ready. They wanted Arden to speak to an assembly of the children and the, <coughs> some parents and some, some of the community. And um, he was going over what he was going to say and so forth and he said to me, you know, I just don't know, it doesn't seem, what do you think? I said, I think you need to learn some of their language. If we just, if you just do all this in English, it's going to be, there must be some people that aren't speaking English at all. And yeah. it's disrespectful yeah. not to, you know, see what you can do to, you know, we had a few days, we were there for a week and and um, so he requested some, that someone teach him some, you know, fundamental words. Hello, I'm his name, you know, uh, I 
feel very honored to be here. I first of all, I want to thank the elders and that sort of thing. It was just, people cried. They, they mm. cried. Mm. And um, <clears throat> the elders, the women, he was taught by women how to say these things, of course, naturally. And they said, this is what's got to happen. This has got to happen all the time. You know, and it was incredibly generous of them to teach him. Yeah. But they were perceiving him to be meaning well, I guess. Yes. So, um, the other workshop we did was out at Crescent Beach. We did um, a workshop with Sharon Jenkerson, who was, uh, she was an adoptee herself from the um, indigenous community. And uh, she did a lot of work in, co in connecting adoptees with their parents. And uh, we, had a, we held a potlatch with the elders there in, at the end of that workshop. And um, we were just out there recently and saw our cedar tree. And by that I mean that our gift to the elders was um, a red cedar that we planted on the land there where we held the workshop. So. I'm sorry, I'm getting a little emotional. Oh, it's a lovely story. So, yeah, yeah. Keep at it. Yeah. yeah. Well, that's... Well, we were talking about forests, and then you talk about planting this cedar tree in the context of... Um, and it's still going, that cedar tree. And learning the language. They all come together. What I, what I liked about seeing <coughs> the cedar tree, too, and I think this is so poetic, if you will excuse me for that, but we planted... We asked the um, people at the Crescent Beach Community Center where, where we were holding the whole thing. It was a, a camp, originally. Anyway, um, where they wanted us to, to plant it. And they had a, a, a fence that came to a point, and they said, well, you could plant it there. So, so we did. We had a, a tr an arborist come and plant it properly because we really wanted it to live, for sure, right? So um, they planted it and everything, and then um, as it grew, when we were last out there, I saw that, of course, it had busted down the fence. So they took the fence away. I was so glad that they didn't mm -hmm. cut the limbs or dis distort it in some yeah. way or even take it down, God yeah. forbid. So um, I was really happy, and I thought, you know, that says something right there. What a lovely story. There's some poetry, but before we go there, I have another question similar to the one I asked before. <clears throat> because in this project, the, the word communal for me is inclusive of, uh, of the, the whole world. Yeah. Right? Mm -hmm. It's one of the dangers of that term, is it can be just thought of as human. But I'm not thinking of it that way. So, let me ask this question. You, your experience is in family therapy. What does a family therapist, what might a family therapist know about forests that we need to know? Oh my gosh, you know, the forest would probably taught us how to be a family. Yeah. We probably learned how to be families from the forest. Mm. I've been reading uh, this wonderful book by Suzanne Samar. I've got it. Finding the Mother Tree. I, I was l listening to her ten years ago. What a brilliant woman. But Rizzo. Absolutely. And, yeah. I, you know, I can I remember in the beginning people thought she was crazy and yeah. laughed at that idea. Yeah. And, uh, you know, then they got angry. <clears throat> but now, gosh, Susan Samard is a genius. Yeah. Well, she was a genius all along. Yeah. But a genius mm -hmm. of someone who lived in the forest and understood the yeah. forest. And that the trees communicate to each other. There's a mother tree. Yeah. So there's the family of trees. I mean, 
obviously <laughs> that's where we learned how to be a family, I suppose. Yeah. And so instead of destroying, we need to learn, you know, we need to study what is going on and how they do it, how they protect each other and speak to each other and keep each other well, you know. We don't know how to stay well, Chris. Yeah. We don't know how to practice wellness. Yeah. Not just physically, but mentally, emotionally. Yeah. All of that. Yeah. Deleuze wrote about that. He talked about a great health, which wasn't really anything to do with the body at all. So, <clears throat> the forests teach us about family. And maybe maybe we need more mothers maybe we need a tree as a mother maybe those mother trees can be our mothers too oh I, I just feel that way yeah. yeah we have these beautiful trees here we really happened on this house and it was like I just thought oh these beautiful trees you know and um, man you can just stand near them and it just feels like they're embracing you mm -hmm. and uh, I can remember that as a child, can't you? Children love trees. Absolutely. They love to climb them. They love to build yes. houses in them. They're just all over them, you know? Like the baby monkeys that they are. You yeah, know? exactly. It's, it's just beautiful. Yeah. You know? Yeah, it's lovely. And I, I'm sure, as a child, I regarded, well, you do, you regard tree is living for sure. I mean, it's alive, it's speaking to you, it's loving you, and uh, you can feel all that, yeah. you know. Animals feel that. You can watch animals do that. Yeah. Dogs, cats, coyotes. Yeah. Thank you for that. That was lovely. Sure. I really appreciate that. I'd love to hear some of your poems, and I think you've got some chosen. I've got some recent ones. I've got a book that I wrote in 1988, I think it was. And uh, some poems, from, this was an anthology of Buddhist poets that I was in. I'd rather not read these old things, quite honestly. It's up to you. you they read. hold up pretty well. I've been happy about that. I look at it every now and then, and I think, okay. Not too bad. Well, just in the light of everything we've been talking about, choose some poems to read. Okay. <clears throat> Maybe a couple of them. Well, in terms of... Um, I, I, I think this is just one in progress. It's not really a finished... Poem. Sounds like life. Yeah. I don't know that any poem is ever finished. It's no. like, you know, painters, you often, painters, you often kind of wrestle the brush out of their hands because they'll just keep painting forever and ever. Dancers yeah. keep dancing. And finally, somebody has to announce to them, it's over. It's done. You did it. <laughs> You know, I get it's like that. the Pope saying to Michelangelo, mm. when will you make an end, you know. Yeah. Anyway, this one's in progress. She's fragrant. <clears throat> She's holy. The whole world is watching. How daily news holds us wrapped in whipped cream, spoiled and boiled, full of fat and oil, trapped in this tapestry, woven and baked and inert. A, ta a travesty in service to these lords, dripping. Please, these are babies. These are innocents. Tomorrow, you can go home tomorrow. Tomorrow you can go home. Tomorrow and tomorrow. And too much. Underground, we escape in an earth ship. An RV, a VW van. What if they threw a deforestation and nobody came? What if no one ever bought another stuff? Some disappear from train wrecks. Were they killed in the crash? Perhaps 
they are simply crazy or they don't want to work. Lazy. Must everyone work? They must. Children in school, adults at work. No shirkers. A lot of people do stop in a pandemic. For red cedar and red alder and red maple, they remain deep in the forest. The bear and the chickadees and the flicka her court of giants, fragrant, cool, and sweet. She's fragrant, she's holy, she's kind. She appears sometimes. Leaders meet over the situation. Which one? The economy exposed like the Wizard of Oz? The big head, actually sad. And small, pulls levers and growls, his voice amped on the mic. Every neighborhood has a big head. Big heads meet at Walmart. Solemnly, they take out their penises in measure. They compete. They discuss munchkin management. The little people must obey the rules. Play the big head games. Then they get more or can join the big head world. She is fragrant. She is holy. She is fragile and she is strong. She's blue, she's rose, she's kind. She does as she does every day because she adores us. Fuck. <laughs> That's fantastic. Now do you believe I'm a poet? <laughs> well, I believed you were a poet, yes. But I bet you never heard me read. I haven't, no, so I want, to, I want more. <laughs> okay, all right. This one is, um, this one, I, I think, I think Arden put this one in the uh, GTEC Reader. Yeah, but I want to hear it with your voice. This is, um, our bedroom has a balcony off it, and it, we have that beautiful park, which is just a ballpark, yeah. really. But nobody could play ball for a year and a half. Yeah. Families began to have picnics out on the, uh, Grass and the park seemed to really appreciate the break, you know. Yeah. Anyway, this is Obad <coughs> in Vancouver. This morning is a morning for hot, sweet tea. The sky so gray it's almost white, yet dark. And our commons, Graymar Park, flat green, with the fall colors all around. A cathedral of trees trembles over our street. I've been picking through the bits and pieces of my life. A matisse in gold and blue. The black crows and the dirty white gulls, busy with bugs and cigarette butts, striding as they do around the yard. Framed by the lattice of my Juliet balcony and the slats of the blinds, I step out to see you as you traipse through the garden of kale and lettuce, rhubarb, dahlias, and herbs on your way to work so early. Whatever, I wonder, waving, happened to play. The long, crazy mornings of love as our teas cooled in their cups. I was seconded to Canada for Tantra, as you so noted in your mandala. I wanted every day to be Saturday, which of course would ruin Saturday. But now the light has really declared itself, and everything that was yawning has dissolved. I do have to tell you this, that Arden says nobody touches me like I touch myself. <laughs> so you have to forgive me, but you know, I will probably get some tears in my eyes. I don't actually break down, but... Well, I don't think forgiveness is required for that. <laughs> this is a, another one on the drawing board here. We cannot see through the clouds of pollution, nor through the mists of time. Yellow is the daffodil. Yellow, deal, yellow is the color of the mean. We step and step, even as the globe turns. How can we not walk in space? The darkness of the universe 
is everywhere. Yet the moon shines on every blade of grass. No matter how hard I try, I cannot be any better than that. When my soul never shops, I like to watch the drama as the sunlight shatters the gray dawn and crashes into the park through the trees and telephone wires and all over the crows and gulls. The rush pulls back and light settles out in an amber slick across the bell diamond, ball diamond and the grass. Oh, wow. Wow. I'm making my day. <laughs> One more? Oh. Or you can say well, no. Um, you can say no, but you know, I think I will read one more. This poem um, actually came up. You know, um, Michael White's death death was a, a great tragedy for all of us. And uh, you know, he was a young man, yeah. and uh, he died very shortly after my sister. I had a ten year sister who was ten years older than I, and she died um, close to when Michael died. And I started this poem around her death. And I was also making a, for, my, for Caroline, my sister, I also made a, a hanging of a origami uh, birds. Yeah. Um, you know, uh, herons for long life while she was sick. But anyway, that's another story. But so I wrote this, I started the poem for her and it's really, evolved over a long period of time and it included Michael's mm. death. So you know when we get older we, we begin to think about death and slowly over time you're not quite as terrified yeah you know but you see it as a great yeah. you know yeah. the, the greatest mystery. Yeah I think about it. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yep. It's called the garage. Chickweed and dandelions, of course, the old standbys, forsythia, wisteria, rhododendron. A few exotics, strange echeveras, Irish moss. A morning glory grasps the antique rose. The garage door gates, and its windows, too. Looking in, oil tools and the ladder neatly stacked. Millweed rags, gas, and rotten ropes, shovels, and the rakes. Grass stuck to the lawnmower. Wasps hang in the air. No fixed address. Despite the strange lethargy of the place, the cats are not tempted to explore. Miss their dinner, someone closed the door. They, with their special ability to see in the dark, we pitifully unprepared see nothing. Even the car is pulled out, only an oil slick on the cement. The rest is to treat us for the dump. The once clever indoor-outdoor thermometer, Christmas lights, shells from Florida, and those taxi yellow boards. Wow. To me there's nothing more beautiful than spoken word. So before we finish, what kind of words would you want to share, or thoughts would you want to share just as we're wrapping up? Oh, um, I think we need to spend a lot of time together envisioning what the new paradigm looks like. When we change our power sources and when we change some of our indulgent ways that we live and, um, and when our leaders get on the ball with us all, then what will it look like? Mm -hmm. What will it be like? Because if we don't know where we're going, how can we go there? So I think it would be very, very good for folks to spend a few minutes every day being 
grateful for what we have and thinking about what it might look like. What it might look like when there's no more gas fumes or pollution as we experienced in the pandemic when the uh, birds come back, fish come back, when we're, um, we're sort of at peace and where neighborhoods become almost like villages. We share, people do business, people are still very smart, very clever, and um, things are better. Our healthcare system is vibrant and healthy and working with things in a very preventative way. Our food is good, the water is pure. And we're learning how to conserve water and how to be careful with the water. We learn about the forest more. We, we have degrees in that, big degrees. And those are the things that we're interested in. I mean, just imagine, you know, as John Lennon said, imagine. I think the war now is not, uh, not war, but realizing what we all know we want. That sounds like a poet's task. Everyone's a poet, Chris. Yes. <laughs>